of celebration we have for all things, for sweet baby Emily and for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's continue in our worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other. Jesus, the only one that could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, sing it holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside.
love to those around me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we praise and adore you. For there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. We glorify, we magnify, and exalt your holy name because you and you alone are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you alone are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. As we sing this song, help us to exalt you and to glorify you. God, be with us, speak to us as only you can. This we pray in your name. together and give the Lord some praise this morning.
such a trust with this precious gift with your power by your love my all i commit on the straight Jeff and Mel and the star of the show, Miss Emily, if they would come up front and stand in front of the communion table and face me if they would. This is such an honor for me, for all of us to be a part of this, so thank you both for inviting us to, to uh, celebrate this moment with you. We've incorporated a special moment into our service today. For the purpose of presenting Emily Hill to the Lord. In 1 Samuel we find a wonderful story of a mother. A mother that God blessed with a little baby boy in this case. This was a special son because God had given him to this family in direct response to Hannah's request for a child. 1 Samuel 1 tells us that Hannah prayed and worshipped the Lord. Hoping for a child. The Bible tells us in verse 19 of this chapter that the Lord remembered her. Look it up. Those are the specific words that God uses here in response to Hannah's plea. The Lord remembered her. Hannah became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. And verse 20 says she named him Samuel. Saying because I asked. The Lord for him. At approximately three years of age, Hannah, along with her child, went to the high priest. And she said, I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. After she gave her child back to God, she and her family stayed at the house of the Lord and they worshipped. Jeff, Mel, you prayed, you fasted, you worshipped, and you asked the Lord for this child, just like Hannah. Today we celebrate with you because the Lord remembers you. The Lord remembered your prayers. The Lord remembered your pleas. The Lord saw your sacrifices. And he performed a miracle on your behalf. And like Hannah, today Jeff and Mel have come to give back this child to the Lord. Jeff, Mel, in order for you to be the parents God wants you to be, it will be your duty to teach your child regularly the principles and truths contained in God's holy word. You will need to watch over her education that it is not led astray by the culture or society of this day. You must make it your daily goal to teach her that true joy in this life and our only hope for life eternal comes in seeking, finding, and following the will of God, our Heavenly Father. You must purpose in your hearts to direct her feet regularly to a place of worship, hopefully this one, and fellowship with other believers, hopefully these. 
You must purpose to keep her from evil influences that might lead her astray and raise her in the Lord's discipline and instruction. You must commit to providing an atmosphere in the home that nurtures and cultivates within her a love for God and a love for others, which are the greatest commandments given to humanity. You must recognize that she is a unique creation with special gifts, talents, and abilities. Encourage her to use those for the purposes of the Lord. You will need to model a Christ-like marriage before her. Each of you serving the other in love, fully devoted to cherishing and caring for the life partner God has blessed you with. Praying and hoping that one day she'll find her perfect match that God has for her. You will need to teach her there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's grace is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And lastly, you will need to daily seek his wisdom and direction. Trust me, you will need to seek his wisdom and direction. Knowing the job before you is too difficult for you on your own. But also realizing that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He promises wisdom to those who ask for it. Wisdom given liberally. So ask and you shall find. Do you hereby promise to faithfully teach and train your child, Emily, in all the ways of the Lord? Do you promise to faithfully honor his word and promote God's work? Do you promise to encourage spiritual growth through personal example of God's graces in daily living as you raise your child? If so, say we do. I'm going to ask the family, any family member of little baby Emily, would you please stand at this moment? Any family member. Anybody that got invited is fine. Any family, please stand. You are very important people in Emily's life. And that's why you're here today. And you will spend many hours and days with her. Your attitudes, your actions, and behaviors will either reinforce the good training that these parents have just committed to or... They will undermine their efforts to see Emily serve the God who gave her life. You have a big role to play, family. Will you pledge to this family, to the Lord, and to Emily on this day to be an instrument God can use to model Christ and his teachings before Emily? And will you commit to prayerful support and encouragement of her parents in their attempt to raise her as God has called them? If so, say we will. You can be seated. Jeff and Mel, you give Emily back to the Lord. You promise to encourage your child to know and love God with all her heart, soul, mind, spirit, and strength. You desire God to take your child and use her for his glory, honor, and praise. You promise to love your child by being an example of God's grace in your own daily life. I'm going to come down there and join you. This is my favorite part. I'm going to take Emily. Oh, she's asleep. Can I take your dress with you? Oh, look at this. Can we just go, ah. Oh. Emily Ann Hill, in the presence of Almighty God, and all of these witnesses, and on behalf of your parents, I dedicate you unto the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this child. We thank you, God, for this miracle, dear God, that you've given this family, that you've given all of us, God, to, to enjoy. God, we're thankful, dear God, that each one of us, God, have, has a role to play in her life. And God, we know now, God, that you're going to lead her and direct her and use her in ways that we can't even imagine or think. God, I can't even begin to think, God, what she might do, God, in this world and in this life that you've given her. But God, all we can do, dear Father, is to raise her in the love, the admiration of you, to teach her the ways that we've committed to this morning, that these parents have committed to. And God, you have to do the rest. That's the hardest part as parents. The hardest part as parents is letting go and trusting God with the life of a little one.
But God, today, this family, this couple has given this child back to you, fully trusting you, committing to you to lead her, to guide her, to love her, to allow your Holy Spirit, God, to minister in and through her all the days of her life. Father, we pray safety and protection over this child. God, we pray blessings over this child and over this family. God, we ask you, God, to use her in any way you see fit. For your kingdom purpose, may your will be done in her life, God. Father, we thank you. We honor you today for the beautiful miracle of life. And we dedicate this child unto you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Oh, man. No, 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 no. Come here. Come here. You're not done. You're not done. I'm going to ask you to face the congregation if you would. Look at this body of believers that's here before you. I'm going to ask them to stand if they would. Everyone stand to make a commitment to this family this morning. These are your family. These are your friends. This is your church family. The ones who will be standing by you in the days and years ahead as you seek to raise this child in the love of God. You will need these people. So smile real pretty at them. It takes a village, they say, and that is so true for all of us who are parents. These people here will be supporting you. They'll be encouraging you. They'll be praying for you. And they'll be cheering for you when times get hard and when you need to feel that someone out there loves you. So congregation, will you repeat after me? As a congregation of family and friends, we, support, we promise to support this family. We promise to pray for them. We promise to encourage them as they seek to nurture and guide this child in all the ways of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this precious gift of life. May you bless this little one. May you bless Emily today. As we lift her before you, our loving Father, we ask for your protection, guidance, and provision to be with them always. May she grow in the light of your goodness and grace. And may her soul be beautiful as you created her to be. We ask this all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask my wife to come. We have... A uh, certificate of dedication for baby Emily that we're going to give to you all. I'll pass it on to Jeff. His, he doesn't have anything in his hands. <laughs> and then we have a little Bible from the church that says, Emily Ann Hill, dedicated 6 19 to let you know we love her. We stand with you guys, and we're so excited for this miracle God's given you. Can we put our hands together and celebrate with this family this morning? <laughs> Turn to 2 Corinthians. If you don't have them, it'll be on the screen in a few moments. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We are here at Gordon Lake. I tend to preach in sermon series format. And we are in the final week of a series we've titled, entitled Transformed. This is week four of the series. But don't worry, if you haven't been here, I will catch you up. So we're talking about transformed. And we've been using the image of a butterfly to compare the transformation that takes place in our spiritual walk. A butterfly. How many of you love butterflies? Come on, show me your hands. How many of you? You love butterflies. But they're just bugs. A butterfly is just a bug. You don't want anything to do with a wasp. 
You don't want anything to do with a spider, probably. But a butterfly comes flying by, and all it just makes you feel fluttery inside. Makes you feel good inside. It brings joy. We have butterflies in our homes. We decorate with them. You can even buy paper towels with butterflies printed on them. Some of you are smiling. You're looking at your wife because you got some in your kitchen. We love butterflies. They give us this sense of wonder and joy in our lives. But here's the thing. Butterflies didn't start out that way. They weren't born that way. They weren't always cute and cuddly like baby Emily. Butterflies weren't always that way. They go through a transformation process known as metamorphosis. And like butterflies, our purpose as Christians is to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Grab that thought right there for a moment. Especially if you haven't been here for this series. Our purpose from the moment we're created is to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And in the first week, we looked at stage one. From the beginning, from the egg, this little guy comes out. He hatches from the egg, a little caterpillar. And he has a plan to be restored and transformed, just like we as Christians do. God created us from the moment we were born, or reborn, if you will. From the moment that we asked God's grace to save our lives, we immediately took on purpose in our lives. We have a purpose. If you're here today and you're saved by the grace of God, you have purpose. And it's not to be a caterpillar. You get reborn and you start to transform. God created us to walk in relationship with him, to walk with him, to do life with him, and to be transformed into his likeness. That begins at stage one, by renewing our mind. How do you find your purpose in life? How do you find God's will for your life? You go back to that moment. Hopefully you're saved. Hopefully you've asked the Lord to come into your heart and to be your Savior. And if you renew your mind and go back to that moment when the grace and love of God was imparted into your life, He will lead you and guide you and show you His perfect will. And then week two, we focused on the the moment after we are born again. What happens after a caterpillar is born? That caterpillar goes on a, an eating spree. Caterpillars are born for the purpose of eating. How many of you share that purpose? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I am excited about eating today. Jeff, I hope you got enough food for me, brother. Caterpillars are born to eat. They're born for good reason to eat because they know they have a purpose. They are eating to prepare themselves to be transformed. They're looking forward to this stage when they need all that food stored up. So in stage two, they begin feeding themselves. Just like the caterpillar, when we become born again, when we hatch from that egg by God's grace, we have to feed on things that are righteous and holy, things of God. If you're not feeding yourself on the things of God, you're not going to be ready for this moment to be transformed. You're not going to be ready. And then last week, we moved to stage three, which is this right. Go back just one more, Kurt. Stage three is the cocoon, the pupa stage. This is stage three. This is the transition stage, if you will. More transition and transformation takes place in stage three than any other stage. In the pupa stage, the caterpillar becomes encased in a protective covering known as a cocoon. Cells that were present in the original caterpillar begin to grow into little feet and legs and wings. Something begins to happen in the life of the caterpillar. Somehow the caterpillar miraculously becomes something different. And the same happens to us. 
When we become saved, when we begin to walk this transformation process with the Lord, and when we submit ourselves to Him, He does something miraculous for us. God created the miraculous process of transformation for a reason. And if we will feed ourselves on the things of God, and if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out, He will do amazing things in our life. Stage three of being transformed by the power of God into a person of righteousness and holiness can only take place when we completely surrender ourselves to him. When God saves us, he intends to completely and radically change us. That is the definition of transformation. Look it up. To be transformed means to be radically and completely changed. You should not look the same. You should be seeking to be transformed by the power of God. And today we're on stage four. And stage four is about becoming this little guy. A butterfly, Spencer. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. We open this series with this very scripture and we're reading it again today. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Verse 18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. Today's a special day. We celebrate new life today in baby Emily. And dedicating her today could not have fallen on a better Sunday. And maybe I planned it a little bit. But throughout this series, we have focused on the miracles of God. And specifically, the miracle of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. If you can stand this morning, I'm going to give this invitation. If you can stand this morning and convince all of us in here today that the miracle of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is not the power and work of God, please do so at this moment. I don't think any of us can come up with a better solution or explanation as to how a caterpillar encases itself into this silky little cocoon and two weeks later comes out as an animal or a bug that can fly, looking completely different. I can't explain it. Science cannot explain it. It cannot be replicated. The same is true for the birth of a child. We agree that Emily, sweet Emily, is a miracle. But aren't we all? Nothing against Emily, but she's no more of a miracle than I am when you look at how life is created. She's no more of a miracle than you are. Life is a miracle. Human life, animal life, plant life, none of it, none of it can be explained outside of a miracle. I remember when we had our first miracle. He's a rug rat now. We went to a doctor's appointment in Chattanooga over at Erlanger. It was a Friday morning. And the doctor looks at us and says, well, you're going to the hospital today. And we were like, oh, no, we're not. We're three weeks early. We, because I was carrying the burden too. So we look at this doctor and we're like, what? He's like, you're having a baby today. And we're like. Yeah, but we're three weeks away from our, our date, our expectant date. And here we go to the hospital, to Erlanger, and later that evening, Charlie was born. They placed him in the NICU. They, they rushed him away. We barely got to see him in the room, and they took him and ran him down the hallway. Took him to the NICU to get some special treatment. And that kicked off one of the longest, hardest weeks of our life. For his first week on this earth, little Charlie lived in the NICU, and 
we only got to go in for scheduled visits. We received a miracle that many of us pray for, just like Hannah. We received a miracle that many of us hope for and ask God for. And God remembered us and gave us a child. But we wanted to take that child home. Day one, I was ready to check out. He'll be fine. <laughs> we got this. We just wanted to take him home. We had taken all the proper steps to bring him home. The house was ready. We were ready. And his nursery was ready. Like all new parents, we had decorated and prepared his nursery. And we were excited to introduce little Charlie to his new room in the home. And we decided we were going to decorate his room with something special. So special that we even had maternity pictures taken with this special decor. We decided that we were going to decorate Charlie's room with the very hungry caterpillar theme. A story that we loved and now cherish even more. You've all seen this book. I'm going to take a moment to talk about this book because we got our kids in here with us today. We canceled kids church just so they could come in here and hear their pastor preach. The Very Hungry Caterpillar. How many of you have read this? Boy, if this doesn't sum up exactly what I've preached on the last few weeks. Guess what? I've got it on the screen. We're going to read it. In the light of the moon, a little leaf lay on an egg. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. He started to look for some food. On Monday, he ate through one apple, but he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate through two pears, but he was still hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums, but he was still hungry. Sounds like my diet. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries, but he was still hungry. On Friday, he ate through five oranges, but he was still hungry. Oh, no, here's my diet. Sorry. On Saturday, he ate through one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of cherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. That night, he had a stomach ache. I can relate. The next day was Sunday again. The caterpillar ate through one nice green leaf, and after that, he felt better. Now he wasn't hungry anymore, and he wasn't a little caterpillar anymore either. He was a big, fat caterpillar. Stage three, he built a small house called a cocoon around himself. He stayed inside for more than two weeks, then he nibbled a hole in the cocoon, pushed his way out, and he was a beautiful butterfly. That's for you kids. Obviously, this story is special to us. But we have discovered these past few weeks, and I have discovered that the story of the caterpillar has significant similarities to the transformation which occurs in our own spiritual life. We have to allow God to do the work in our lives to transform us without us getting in the way. I had no understanding. I had no explanation as to why my son, my firstborn, who I prayed for and believed for and hoped for, had to stay in a NICU for a whole week. One week he was in there. Scheduled visits. Why did this have to happen? Why couldn't we just take him home? By the end of the week, I figured out that it was God's plan. He had had a couple of episodes during his sleep that could have cost him his life had he been at home. And I began to realize that I don't need him to come out of the cocoon until he's ready 
to cook them out of the cocoon. Because I'm not the creator of the process. It was God. The next Friday, the doctor met with us. And he looked at us and said, well, you're going home. And boy, were we excited. After a week, we finally get to take our blessing, our miracle home. The nurses in the NICU asked us if they could give Charlie a gift. And we were like, well, sure. So as we were being, or packing up, when we were being discharged, all the NICU staff came around us and around our baby, and they gave him this book. And every one of them, including the doctors, wrote him a special message. It was at that moment, knowing that we had chosen that decor to decorate his room, his nursery, that God was speaking to us. Pastor, that's a children's book. I get it. I understand that. This book was the affirmation and the encouragement and the insurance that I needed that God was doing what he needed to do to transform my son's little body in his own time. He was the creator of life. He knew what was best for our little boy. And I had to realize that I didn't need to worry about what my opinion of the matter was because I wasn't the expert. When we get saved, when we begin to feed ourselves on the things of God, something different starts to happen in our lives. We begin to transform. Paul says it's not an option. Paul says you are transformed. You can't choose otherwise. I shared this a couple of weeks ago. As bad as you might want to, You can't choose to be what God didn't purpose you to be and be successful at it. The caterpillar cannot think really hard about being a frog and become a frog. There's nothing the caterpillar can do to stop the purpose that it was created to be, and that was to be a butterfly. You can't do that either. You can't change the purpose God has for your life. And if you're trying to do that, then you're hindering the power of God in your life. When we begin to be transformed, when we go through that cocoon stage, when we go through that moment where we're allowing the Holy Spirit to minister in and through us, when we've surrendered our whole self to the Lord, something different begins to happen in our lives. If you're here today and you're saved by the grace of God and you don't feel or look or act any different than you did before when you were living in sin, then you're not being transformed. And you're hindering God's purpose for your life. Your purpose was to be crea- was, was created. You were created but for this purpose to serve Him, to honor Him, and to be in His image, to be like Him. You begin to feel different when you're transformed. You don't carry yourself the same way. You don't even look the way you used to. Why? Because you've surrendered yourself to the process. You've started to take on the likeness of Christ. You're beginning to emerge as the beautiful butterfly that God purposed and created you to be from the beginning. How does this miracle happen? How does the miracle happen of being transformed from a little caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly? It will only happen if you get out of the way. It will only happen if you get out of the way. Kurt, go back to the the cocoon. I want you to look at the picture of this cocoon. This caterpillar at this moment has surrendered his entire life to the process. He is no longer in control of what's taking place. This caterpillar will only come out and emerge from this protective cocoon when it is ready. 
when nature says it's ready, when God says it's ready. And you will only be transformed in the timing that God has for your life. You can't speed it up. You can't slow it down. You can't get in the way of it. Don't try to interfere with what God is trying to do in your life. Life comes at us fast. Life comes at us hard. Life comes at us unexpectedly sometimes. And if you want to try to handle that yourself, then go for it. But in those moments, it's easy to forget what our purpose is, what we were created to do. And if you're being transformed by the power of God, you don't have to live life like a caterpillar anymore. Did you hear what I just said? If you choose to allow the power of God to transform your life, show them the caterpillar, Kurt. You don't have to live like the caterpillar anymore. So why are you still there? Why are you still at the place you were spiritually when God saved your soul? You're just inching your way through life like a little caterpillar. On your belly. Trying to get through. When you were created with purpose to fly. To be beautiful. To be like Christ. Can you think about that a moment? I am so thankful that Emily looks like her mother. Let's just praise him a moment. Regardless of who she looks like or who you look like, your purpose was not to look like your parent. Your purpose was to look like Jesus. That's your, been your purpose since the day you were hatched. That's the, that was your purpose when you were born as a child. And that was your purpose when you were born again as a believer. That is your purpose. Romans 8 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to some ship, the redemption of our bodies. Listen at this. We groan. We groan and go through life and it's painful and it's difficult and it's tough. Waiting for God to call us home. Won't that be a great day? But Tina, listen to this. It says, it says right here, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Everyone standing if you would this morning. What encourages me in my transformation process? Let me tell you something. When you are in the cocoon, when you are in cased in that cocoon and you're waiting for God to do that transformation in your life patience is not one of your greatest virtues it might not be one of your greatest qualities you're like God I've been feeding myself on your word I've been doing what I'm supposed to do I've been living a life of holiness and righteousness in your eyes as you give me the strength And then life happens and you take four steps back. And you're like, God, I'm done with this. Let me tell you something. The transformation process takes time. And as much as we want to be the beautiful butterfly, we won't fully be in the image and likeness of Christ until he calls us home. What keeps me going every day? When life gets hard, what keeps my, me putting one foot in front of the other? What keeps me encouraged and feeling uplifted in the Lord and knowing that He's on my side? We 
just read it in Romans 8. It's the hope that one day God's going to call me home that I might be divinely made like Him. That I might be the butterfly He created me to be. That's my hope. Don't let this world that God's given you Don't let this life that God's given you be wasted as a caterpillar. Don't let it be wasted. I just prayed over sweet Emily that God would have His perfect will for her life and that she wouldn't waste it as a caterpillar, but that she would go chasing, pursuing the purpose that He has for her, and that is to be like Him. May we all do that. May we all be like Christ today.